Hello, everyone. My name is Joe McKinney, CEO of the Startup Society Foundation. Today, we have a very exciting podcast. We have a lot of masterminds in multiple different initiatives here today. Today, we are joined by Tom W. Bell, uh, creator of Ulex, Matt Shoot of Hollowchain, and Philip Saunders of New Hans Network. Hello, everyone. Do you want to give yourselves a quick intro, starting with Matthew? Yeah, my name is Matthew Schutte. As you said, I'm the Director of Communications for Holo. Uh, we are building two things, Holo Chain, which is a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, applications framework. It enables people to build and run applications using just the devices of the users themselves. And then Holo is sort of one of the first big flagship applications operating using Holo Chain, and it's a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace. So I'll keep it with that and pass it to the next person. Tom, you want to do a quick intro? Sure. Thanks, Joe. Um, I created Ulex to solve a problem for clients. They needed the best practices in legal systems without flags attached. And that's what Ulex offers. It uh, collects substantive and procedural rules from the world's most trusted and neutral sources from private and international organizations and puts them together in this organized framework that while not in itself enough to run an entire community is an important kernel of a government operating system. So what we're aiming at ultimately, when I say we, I mean a loose community of a lot of people, I'm sure a lot of them in the whole community are aiming at creating governing institutions which are, um, decentralized and distributed, and Ulex offers for that kind of governing OS a kernel. It's much like the Linux kernel at the heart of the most popular OS in the world, which is the Android operating system. And I'll stop there. Thank you. All right, so uh, I'm Philip Saunders. Uh, I'm CTO of New Hans Network. So um, I'm, I've been involved in a couple of projects just uh, as CTO of Nuhans. Um, so I wrote the, I've written two white papers so far, uh, mainly focused on, you know, issues of, of land registry and, uh, and identity that we're, that we're building. Um, I'm also involved just in an open source uh, capacity with, with Ulex. I'm hoping to contribute some, some, uh, some, some code and some things to the white paper. And uh, so I'm, I'm pretty interested in, in civic technology and uh, decentralized governance. All right. So to really dem uh, to deepen the conversation, uh, Matthew, what is the problem that Holochain is trying to solve? So the problem that Holochain is trying to solve is basically how can we coordinate our activities with one another? Essentially, how can we constrain our own behaviors in ways that work for us without having to resort to some third party enforcer? Uh, so it's really about coordination. For us, this project comes out of a larger uh, project called the Meta Currency Project that we've been working on for well over a decade. And for for me in particular, I came into all of this through political philosophy, basically. I was trying to figure out uh, approaches for how communities could self-steer better. And after about a decade of looking for answers and not finding much, I had a series of epiphanies around how communities actually steer themselves when they're small, the way in which those mechanisms tend to be quite different from the things that we usually rely upon for helping communities steer themselves when they're big. Uh, the main difference there being small communities rely quite heavily on what I call discretion, but a lot of people can access more easily through terms like reputation. Uh, whereas large communities tend to rely really heavily on violence, uh, that the police and prisons and that whole side of the legal system is really the, the, uh, sharp end of the stick when it comes to how larger communities tend to enforce social norms. Long story short, I realized that the uh, 
approaches that small communities use have a whole bunch of advantages. They're more efficient, they're more effective, they're more adaptable, but unfortunately they historically have not scaled very well. If the community starts to get really large, it's very difficult for you to have access to the relevant information to help you make a decision about whether or not to interact with somebody in a particular way, whether or not to make yourselves vulnerable to them, for instance. Small community, not a big problem. Big community, big problem. Holochain is a, a piece of the answer for how we can enable people to agree on some norms and enforce those without having to put some central power in place with a primary enforcement being that other people turn away from you when you do stuff they don't like. So I'll sort of leave it there for, for right now. And uh, Tom, I'd like to ask the same question. What is the main problem that Ulex is trying to solve? Uh, thank you, Joe, for asking. I, I said earlier uh, that I wrote it to solve a client problem. That's true. It was for a particular client. It's how a problem always first arises. But I saw the same problem recurring elsewhere. And um, I just want to say this before I forget, because something Matthew said really struck me. I think it's, it just bears noting that he described uh, the hollow chain as part of a larger system. And I just thought that's, that's, uh, it's actually reassuring in a way to hear that realistic uh, modesty. And, uh, and I think it can, you know, I, I hope that you got the same thing from, from my expression uh, of what Ulex's aims are, it's just to provide a part. And that's very, you know, suggestive. Somehow I bet these parts will fit together. But back, Joe, to your uh, question more particularly. Well, all sorts of communities need the law. Humans actually love the law. They do. They do. I think we should like rename maybe humans from Homo sapiens, you know, the, the wise one to, uh, uh, to uh, Homo elegans, you know, the choosing, the, 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 the man who chooses, the person who chooses. Now, not always wisely, but we choose. And that's what we want to do. We want to choose the laws we live under. And we can, when we can do that, if they're good rules and they're administered in a fair way, I mean, that's a recipe for a really strong, happy community. People don't want to have laws, of course, imposed on them from without. But uh, yeah, it should come from within. And again, to return to Matthew's uh, really uh, uh, intriguing uh, comments, it, it reminds me, uh, I'm sure he's read uh, Hayek, it reminds me of Hayek's fatal conceit. And it's in a way, Matthew's saying, we have an answer for, for Hayek's fatal conceit. Hayek said, we have these norms, which are great norms for small communities. They, they've sort of evolved both culturally, more culturally than uh and biologically, I'm sure it's a mix of everything. We've evolved to have, you know, these communities that operate in these norms. Don't hurt each other. Be fair. Share when somebody needs something. You know, stuff that works in a village. They're a big family. But it doesn't scale, said Hayek. And, and Matthew says, yeah, it can scale. And I kind of want to do the same thing with the law. Uh, it's, it's easy to find laws that you want in a small group. Well, I shouldn't say easy, but <laughs> it's more doable than when you're under the thumb of some coercive empire. Um, but it's hard to see how larger communities can cooperate to have, not, I'm not gonna ask for cultural norms in common, but just flipping legal norms, you know, so we understand for everybody what it means to breach a contract. You know, it's not exalted metaphysics, it's really work a day, what are the rules, and how do we resolve conflicts when we have a business conflict or a family conflict? There are all kinds of conflicts, and that's what Ulex is for. And yeah, just to, just to go on that, I mean, I think it's interesting how you know, if you look at the real world and, and, and how people interact, I mean, rules emerge from from the aftermath of disputes, you know, and, and it, it's it's in specific contexts that, you, you know, you start out and you don't always know um, exactly what the rules are. But then as things uh, happen spontaneously within some kind of a social arrangement, that's when people kind of discover what's a good way to do things, you know, what shouldn't be done. And so having a kind of a system that can reflect that sort of that sort of spontaneous order, um, I think that's one of the things that I'm I'm really excited about Holochain. But that suggests, if I may, uh, I was wondering, oh, how does Holochain and Ulex, how do they work together? A, a way they could work together, because Ulex, Ulex itself is pretty static. I mean, you know, there's a repository on GitHub and it's up to version 1.1 and it'll continue to evolve that way. No doubt, no doubt at all. But um, there's nothing in Ulex really to kind of set up what you really want to have in a legal system, which is a record of dispute resolutions and the reasons for it that's searchable and publicly accessible and is subject to commentary and all the things that create a legal culture. When we can have a universal legal culture, by universal I mean basically 
or anybody, no matter where you are, as long as you kind of sign a contract or join a community where they say, Ulex, we're running Ulex, you know, Ulex used here. And then we'll have this repository of universal law that will evolve, as you say. So I want to see that happen. And Ulex will do that. And if Hollow can, can do that, yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Um, I love the point that you both of you brought up. Uh, Phil, up your point about cultural norms. One of the things that actually uh, kind of led me down this path was the realization that and this may sound funny based on you know, what, how Tom's pitching this, but my realization in the middle of law school that culture always trumps law. And, and the reason I say that is law is just words on a page somewhere. It doesn't actually take action or effect in the real world unless somebody implements it. Some police officer, you know, goes and <laughs> arrests the guy for doing that thing. Or what I realized is if, if the police officer doesn't enforce that, or if the judge doesn't slap the police officer for doing it wrong, or if the people don't go riot in the streets, you might get something very different from what we wrote down in the first place, because it's always subject to interpretation. It doesn't take effect in the world until it's literally embodied in the brains and bodies of the people themselves, where it, it is shaping their expectations about what's appropriate. And the... The interesting thing for me there that that opened up was, oh, okay, culture is, in, is held inside of the brains and bodies of the participants, just like law is held in some legal document or in a whole chain app, for instance, it could be the, the shared rules um, that a, a number of people are, are sort of playing together in accordance with, they're making use of those rules for helping coordinate their activities. But the, the culture side enables us to come into alignment about some set of rules that we're choosing to play by. And, but at the same time, it gives us some freedom. It gives me the freedom to try to play some additional game with another person, right? I can choose to constrain myself in some new way in addition to the game that I'm playing with you. I don't have to get everybody else's permission to do that. And so it enables a community to experiment with different rule sets simultaneously. It enables sort of many communities uh, to be trialing different ways of working together alongside one another. And if I find that making use of some particular rule set isn't working for me, <laughs> I keep getting screwed over or it's just too much of a, a burden to be keeping track of those particular things, whatever the reason, I can stop using those. And essentially I'm opting out of playing that game with those other actors. Um, the one other point that I'll make is, and I think there's a whole bunch of answers that open up here, but I have a question uh, for Tom or Philip around what the different, um, methods of enforcement are that they envision for communities making use of ULEX during or after, I suppose, conflict resolution. So I, I just wanted to say, uh, Matthew, that's that's a really interesting point about culture. Uh, one of the things about about culture and, and you know, this word reputation that we have, um, a key component to that is memory and, and being able to have a kind of uh, you know, have some kind of a record. And I, I think in, in um, you know, maybe, you know, old times, let's say, um, you know, that just would have been, been you know, memory, you know, just in, in a literal sense. And uh, one of the things that, that um, you know, if you go back to the early days of, of, um, of, of blockchain, you know, especially Bitcoin, you know, one of the, one of the, one of the things that, that appealed to a lot of people about, blockchain is this idea that you can keep a record and you can keep kind of memories, let's say, of, you know, who owns what and, you know, what sort of, uh, you know, what currency belongs to which address, etc. cetera. Um, I think increasingly, one of the things that's drawn me to Holochain, especially coming from the blockchain kind of Ethereum sort of smart contract kind of world, is um, I think you're increasingly seeing um, a lot of the kind of the early principles of of this community, which is the idea of of you know of of uh, getting rid of third parties, decentralization. I mean, it's in, increasingly 
quite centralized in in the way um, kind of blockchains are constructed. It's a very kind of kind of client server kind of structure, and I think because of the way it's architected, it's only going to that's only going to uh, that's only going to grow. It's it's only going to become increasingly centralized, and I think a lot of people are, re are realizing that you just can't. You know, when, when you think of the, if there's kind of, um, you know, trade-offs like that, you know, either you can scale or, uh, you know, you become centralized or you, you can remain decentralized and you don't scale. And I think one of the things that that hollow chain brings, it's, it's uh, I mean, the comparison I use, it's kind of kind of a cliche comparison, but but the Copernican revolution, which is, you know, this idea that, that you know, when you think that the earth is the center of the universe and you're trying to, to Look up the sky, and you're trying to make calculations of, of how to prove this. You know the the the, um, the calculations become incredibly complex. But when you just do a simple move where you just put the sun at the center of the solar system, then it becomes it suddenly becomes very simple. And I think this that's the kind of the comparison I use with with Holochain, which is the idea instead of trying to sort of centralize all of the data, all of the memory, let's say in one place and have everybody sort of share that sort of single source of data. Instead, you have an agent centric approach and the kind of the, the kind of quote immutable part of it is the rule set. And of course it's in Holochain, it's possible to, to fork the rule set. You can, um, you can sort of opt out and go into different rule sets. But the point is, as long as people have some kind of way of knowing what rule set they're using, then you don't need to centralize the data. You can people can have their own data. They can have their own chain. And I think that when you think of of how some kind of a, a cultural or legal system like Ulex could work in the real world, I think that's 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 what you're talking about, which is that you can have different communities that you know have their own set of rules that they're kind of opted into, and they can you know because. You know, let's say there's there's quite a complex or quite a large history of of disputes or cases or or you know even even laws that might emerge from that. You, it's it's much easier to kind of scale that because you don't have to keep all of that in one place. So I just wanted to make a kind of a, a technical point and, and and a philosophical point to that. Hey, thanks, Philip. If if I might, as I uh, heard it, Matthew left us with a question and. Uh, I respond to problems. So thank you, Matthew. I want to go back and actually, I actually heard you raise sort of three issues. I find nothing to disagree with in what Philip, my friend, said. It's just he's not giving me a bow to chew on. And here, uh, I, I want to return to what you said, and I agree with it. You said norms shape not just culture, but legal culture on the ground. That's what I heard you to say, Matthew, something like that. So we're like, you know, what you got on paper is fine, but at the end of the day, it's the cop with the gun in his hand who decides whether or not he's going to call this one in. And I agree with that, but I want to add, and by the way, I'm going to say you're an excellent company. I was at an event in San Francisco where Tyler Cowen spoke last uh, week, it was, and he made something very much like the same point in the context of charter cities. And his point, like yours, is sort of, well, you know, rules, written rules only get you so far. Culture controls a lot. I agree. I agree. No doubt. But consider also that. The effect of culture can be shaped by legal rules, specifically rules of procedure. And that's the nice thing, a nice thing about UX is the rules, the default rules for adjudicating disputes don't appeal to a third party authority. The, the adjudicating body is formed by the parties who have the dispute. Now, of course, they've already had some sort of mediating contact. They both agreed to be in a system that runs ULEX. It might not be the same system because, you know, just like uh, different, uh, as different computers running Apple's OS can talk to each other, you could have two systems running kind of, you know, different versions, a newer one and an older one of, of ULEX, but they could talk to each other. So there you go. I want to say that about norms, shaping culture, agreed, even legal culture, yes, but a good legal system, like I dare say ULEX, can offer procedural rules that shape the effects of culture. So even cultures that are not, we don't think of as being especially rule oriented. I don't know, I don't want to cast any stones, but maybe I think Tyler chose this one, Russia, you know, they kind of do things a little more wild haired way. But even Russians running Ulex would find, oh, I can't just, you know, uh, whip out my uh, saber or whatever they're doing that's chaotic in Russia. All right, let's go to another thing you said, and I'll get to your last point, Matthew, was e enforcement or enforcement, you know, in these in digital networks. 
but you also raised this issue of opting out. Totally agree there too. You said people need to be able to opt out of systems and into the systems they want. I mean, that's pretty much what I said. Totally agree. Let me put this in the context of UX though. Two things. One, people need a default. You need to have a default for people who don't think in their because they don't, because I've already looked at the code, who don't think to make reference to what body of law is going to control disputes arising under this agreement. <laughs> I've had this conversation so many times, so pardon me if I feel a little frustrated. I, I really dig what the coders are doing, and they're making smart contracts and talking about how the disputes arising under this contract will be resolved, and they don't say what body of law is going to apply, and it will apply, and I can give you plenty of reasons. Let me give you an example. you got a contract that says we have to have three or four signatures for this transfer of funds to happen. It's a smart contract. And one of the parties alleges after the fact, the signature was extracted at the point of a gun. Someone was in my office and they said, open your computer and do that or I'm going to blow your brains out. Now, that's not a valid signature, legally speaking. And now this digital system has a problem. Are we going to do the humane, right, legal thing? Or are we going to let this machine grind forward and, and allow violence? So you need good default rules. And I offer UX as that. So Another thing about UX, it makes opt out easy. It makes opt, it's built for opt out. It's just a default. It's a neutral good default. And if you want to opt out, it just says basically it's got provisions that say you enter a contract, we enforce the contract. And that's what happens now. And that's what's going to happen under UX. All right, now to enforcement. Talk about norms, talk about opt out. As usual, I think UX is the answer to all your problems, but I'm <laughs> just that way. <laughs> enforcement. But here I'll say UX can't help you a whole lot. Well, what UX can provide is, with a lot of supporting infrastructure, a reliable source of judgments about what is, well, I'm going to say legal, but I think I can say fair. I mean, I think the rules used in UX basically, don't ask me, I didn't make them up, right? It's a consensus view of a lot of really super smart people motivated to find good legal rules. And people use these rules in practice, and they work. We see states running the same rules that are used in UX. Real governments use them in the real world, and it works. That's why I use them in UX. But UX doesn't have any guns, you know, no badges. It is part of a system that can issue things like a decision from an oracle that provides a signature on the kind of M of N digital contract we actually can trust because there's humans in the loop. Yes, you like to be great for that. Now, how you give that digital contract, you know, muscle in the world is oh, that's up to you folks at the, you know, at the hollow train, I guess, to figure out. And I think you will figure it out. I, I kind of get the abstract idea, but you know, that's something that that's your job. <laughs> you like his job is to provide adjudications according to specified rules and by algorithms, which all of which are trusted and public and adopted consensually by the parties and, and allow easy opt out. So nobody should feel trapped. They won't feel trapped. It's just sort of, a, oh, this is a good kind of bland, vanilla, I don't know, Ford Taurus kind of <laughs> um, um, for the masses legal system. You want to do something bespoke and fancy, go for it. Do your Scientology or whatever legal system you want. Just don't hurt anybody. There are limits. I'll stop I just there. wanted to jump in there because I, 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 I know I didn't answer, um, Matthew, I didn't answer your, your, your direct question. But uh, in, in terms of the direct answer to that, um, I think it really comes in the sort of be, you know before you go into contracts i think if uh, if in addition to tulex we had some kind of a, a legal kind of script let's say you know to to build contracts and you know you can specify the kernel um you know the default kernel is is of course the the the, the restatements the common law um you can specify the kernel that's that's you know the body of rules that that's going to be used to you know, judge any dispute that might happen. And if you can specify that in a contract and then in advance, uh, you know, specify, you know, the, the the two parties, let's say to the agreement can specify, uh, you know, a set of judges that can, um, or a set of mediators, let's say, who can, who can then sort of jump in in the case of a dispute. Um, and I think, it, but really we're talking about a lot of other infrastructure that needs to be built, you know, whether it's, it's sort of legal script and languages um, I've actually worked a little bit on that myself in the past. Uh, there, there was um, I was developing a, a legal script and language called Codex, um, and I've, I'd, I'm quite interested in in going back to that. Um, but yeah, so I think there's a lot of sort of second layer infrastructure, and and especially with the cultural aspect, you know, with with reputation, I think you can have some kind of um, sort of sort of encoded reputational 
consequence, let's say. Another 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 great approach that to, uh, to that is staking. So if people can can be sort of staked financially in in in, in contracts in advance and or in the outcome, that's a good way. It, it's it's really more like insurance than 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 than, than loss. So you can kind of combine aspects of of insurance where people like stake things in advance and and that can then be used to kind of um i guess sort of back up uh, sort of make uh you know outcomes of of cases you know just that bit more binding without the need to to use force let's say so i just wanted to add that oh if you yeah. want mechanisms the three are staking burning as in rep or ostracism boom 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 <laughs> exactly now they Wonderful. Yeah, I, I, from my perspective, and I, I have very, you know, I haven't dove deep into Ulex yet. I've got to peruse some of the materials, but um, uh, my, the way in which it feels like it lines up with some of the stuff that we've been working on, and uh, though we're not necessarily working at that layer, is in the kinds of shared rules or shared agreements that a community is going to make use of. And I hear you going, hey, there's a whole bunch of this stuff that's been worked out through the legal system and you know, common law and all that stuff. We've, we've tried a bunch of things for hundreds of years and we've learned some lessons. Uh, and my belief is what we're going to see over the coming decade or two is an explosion of variety, actually, in the rule sets that communities make use of for coordinating their activity. Uh, we think of Holochain as being kind of akin to DNA. In fact, part of the Holochain applications, uh, we call the DNA of that app, and that's basically the, the code, the shared rules. The idea there is that DNA includes the instructions that lead, if given the right resources, to a specific biological organism taking shape, right? It could become an eagle if it's one set of DNA. It could become a jellyfish if it's a different set of DNA, a redwood tree if it's a different one. And But that underlying new way of encoding information showed up on the scene, and then we had this Cambrian explosion of organisms, right? There was a huge increase in the variety of species available thanks to that new medium, essentially. And our hope is that Holochain can serve as the uh, DNA, basically, for social organisms, ways of humans, primarily, coordinating their activities with one another so that they can do new things, right? Today, the social organisms that we have are things like hospitals, or a university, or a representative democracy, or a C corporation in the United States, for instance. And most, those are different variations on the same theme. Those are various forms of hierarchy. And we think that there's a whole bunch of new ways of playing together that people will be able to try. Not all of them will work. Right? We're assuming people are going to try stuff and go, man, we tried it and it sucked. <laughs> and they'll try something else and they'll go, that worked better. And then somebody else is going to see that work, that useful, vibrant experiment, and they'll go, "Ooh, yeah, we want to try that too." And they'll borrow those rules, borrow those those patterns, and depending on where they apply them, they may work great and they may not, because the same set of rules applied in a different context might not fit that context at all. Um, but through trial and error, we're going to see a whole bunch of, I think, wisdom emerge. And I could see the kind of system that Tom is talking about with Ulex as being a seed for some of that that's building upon and borrowing from uh, basically hundreds of years of all refinement that's already gone on. That's an apt uh, description, Matthew. I totally agree. I, I see it, uh, Ulex, as merely a, a little uh, imperfection, perhaps, that is a seed for a crystal in this, this super saturated solution. I mean, we're not super saturated yet, but um, you're closer to the action than I am. So you could probably attest to the fact, wow, things seem to be changing in, I think, really good, positive ways. But, you know, interesting new ways we haven't seen before. And things are going to pop in some interesting ways. I think you could be at the center of some of that and some something beautiful could come up. Well, I mean, this is a question. Uh, I mean, from from Matthew. I mean, I think that there's a great potential for 
for both both Ulex and Holochain to to really make a more uh, to bring more humanity to to the internet. Let's say um, I think. Um, you know, when you can kind of structurally place agency at the kind of at the kind of the core kind of structural architecture, um, I think a lot of interesting things can come for that. When you place agency, then people can opt into different systems and create these different organisms. But I just wanted to, um, Matthew, like I just wanted to ask, like, what do you, what what's your vision as to how Holochain could could transform the internet? Uh, like in combination with like cultural and legal systems and maybe some financial components as well. Like what's your vision of that? Sure. Uh, you touched on a core principle earlier in your previous comments, Philip, around memory. Uh, I'll, I'll back up just a little bit and, and kind of touch on game theory, but the, the basic gist is if we're playing, uh, if I don't know anything about you, if you're anonymous, I'm not able to dis to tell the difference between you and any other human that could walk in front of me, then I have to interact with you kind of with my guard up, right? I don't know anything about you. And if I know that nobody else is going to know anything about this interaction between us, we're operating in this anonymous environment. And so we have to do some heavy duty sort of self-protection in order to interact with one another. However, if I am able to remember things, then from previous interactions, I can learn, hey, what is this person like? Are they good at fixing cars? Do they, are they nice to other people? Do they steal? Whatever the, the specifics of, of that situation are, that context, or that, that I might want to pay attention to. If I'm going skiing and I'm looking for guidance on how to get down this hill without killing myself, whether or not you're a wonderful surgeon doesn't matter a whole bunch. I wanna know if you know the mountain, right? And so um, us being able to build upon past experience, our own past experience, but also other people's past experience, right? If somebody else had some interaction with you and they go, oh my goodness, he's wonderful, he's brilliant, he uh, is not only incredibly technically adept, but he is really deeply wise in his understanding of why we would want to approach something a specific way. He's basically a philosopher and an artist as well as a technologist. If somebody came to me and said that, I would go, yes, I want to work with that guy, right? At least I would if I knew them <laughs> and trusted their opinion in, in those regards. Um, in terms of the, the way in which we're seeing this making the internet better, you had touched on agency and shifting to an agent-centric approach earlier. And we've been talking a little bit about culture here so far. We've been talking about community. Well, one of the unusual uh, things that I... I Loved your reference to the Copernican revolution because I kind of see this in that way myself. Um, it's really common for us to talk about community and try to describe it from a bird's eye view, looking down at the community, looking, looking from a, the top and going, ah, these people are Americans or these people are, you know, residents of San Francisco. But that kind of misunderstands what a community actually is. Something isn't a community unless you have communication. You could, you, I mean, if, if, that, if, if that wasn't the case, we could go, okay, the, blue, the people who drive blue Kias, right? Uh, the, the Korean cars, that's a community. Well, not really, it's a category. It allows me to, to go, okay, that's a person who's driving a blue Kia and that's a person who's driving a blue Kia and this guy is not but you wouldn't have information propagate across that community because they're not talking to one another in any specific way. But once you start to go, oh, wait a minute, the key to community is communication, you start to realize as soon as you have communication, you have community. You have some slightly different community. And so there are a handful of us on this call. We, at some level, are in community with one another here. We're sharing information, we're being influenced by one another, et cetera. Now, of course, Philip has relationship with Tom that is much deeper than my relationship with Tom because he's been chatting with him and working with him. And, and so they also have a community. It may be just a two-person community. 
but I think of this as like Venn, a Venn diagram <laughs> kind of, of community. And we're able to enter into relationships with others and work with them. And, and depending on how that works, we may go, ooh, I jumped into that too fast. You know, I, next time I'm considering handing my car to somebody to have them fix it, I should probably look up a couple things first. I should see if they've been vetted by other people that I know. I should see if some organization that um, assesses whether they're engaged in unfair uh, dealings of some sort, like a small business bureau kind of thing, you know, if they've vouched for them, those kinds of, um, that's, that's a sort of, hey, I'm going to adjust my behavior now to, to get a better outcome next time. Okay. The other piece here, and so that's, uh, I'll, just, I'll just make one last point. So just to summarize that, that's kind of like, hey, we can opt into ways of playing together. And we can do many of those at the same time. But the other piece is we're actually hoping to catalyze new economic models. At the core of economics is uh, recognition recognition of contribution and in the past it's the real hard part has been essentially a memory issue kind of like philip was saying but it was really an integrity issue a data integrity issue part of the reason why governments have specialized printers for printing their currency is because if they didn't anybody could print the currency and that currency wouldn't have integrity well cryptography gives us some interesting things, if somebody has a private key, it's almost like they have a printer that nobody else can duplicate, right? So each individual just for very, for almost no money basically, uh, can generate a private key that nobody else has. And then they're able to start stating things, making speech acts or issuing currency, their own currency, like, hey, I vouch that this guy was great. That's from our perspective, a form of currency. It's a reputation currency. Um, those kinds of systems become possible. With distributed data integrity, we start being able to coordinate in ways that, that just simply weren't previously available to us. And we see that unleashing all sorts of coordination, not just legal coordination, but economic coordination. And so we think it's going to be something that will will get adopted widely, uh, especially in places that are uh, having failures <laughs> of currency as it currently exists in places like Turkey, Venezuela, et cetera. Tom, you were going to say something. Yeah, I want to repeat back what I hear you say to make sure that I get it, because uh, I think you've probably found that uh, hollow chain is not the simplest thing in the world to understand, but you're really good at it. Yeah. So let me see if I got it. So you described sure. it as kind of a as akin to DNA, you're expecting, you're hoping there'll be this Cambrian explosion of uh, communities, institutions uh, running on the hollow chain. And uh, I take it when you talk about it, when you invoke this DNA um, metaphor, that, that the hollow chain would be not the DNA of any particular species, uh, but rather sort of DNA as an idea or, or information encoding and replication and reading system. That's what kind of the hollow chain is like. And it's going to allow all these different species of institutions, communities, running that uh, that kind of DNA-ish uh, code. So uh, that's is that roughly correct? It is. Yeah, that's very much correct. Um, oh, good. <laughs> and, and if I can continue. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Right. I'm yeah, afraid I'll forget it. I did, make, I did take notes. <laughs> so on that view, Ulex would probably, you. I'm just trying to see this from your perspective, Matthew. I'm thinking, uh, and mine too, I mean, if I'm right. Uh, Ulex wouldn't be something in the hollow chain. It's something that institutions, it was kind of like mitochondria, you know, that the institutions running in the hollow chain might find really useful, but that's for them to decide. And if, you know, it works out for them, they thrive and they have offspring, et cetera. And if not, then nice try. <laughs> um, and is that yeah. good too? Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 get, Philip, Philip has a pretty decent understanding, I think, of both systems. Philip, do you want to comment? Sure. Um, yeah, I was just going to say that I think the, so just to kind of make it explicit, I think that the, if you look at the procedural rules of, of ULEX, so uh, maybe, maybe Tom is a better person to explain this, but but it's it's basically that that if there's two people who have a dispute, um, both can choose a judge, those two judges can choose a third, 
um, to break the, a tie break in the case of of um, of you know both, both uh, if, if cases of tie break, and uh, then the, uh, the 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 winner of the, uh, the 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 winner of the dispute gets to both sides propose remedies, and then whoever loses the case pays the the, the remedy or, or has to fulfill the remedy of of um, whoever wins the case. So those are a kind of, it's a kind of a simple protocol for for resolving cases in ULEX. And I think where this can be relevant to Holochain, this can be kind of encoded in a kind of a DNA within Holochain. So this is the kind of the the kind of the, the rule set, you know, like I, I kind of mentioned before, which is that, you know, it's not so much the data that's the immutable part, um, but it's more to do with the rule set. Um, so people can 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 know in a pretty easy way that that they're they're following a certain rule set. Of course, they can fork that and and you know create a different rule set, but that's that essentially creates a different community. Um, yeah. I kind of just in 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 um, in Matthew's answer earlier, um, I thought an interesting point was um, really what I was trying to get at with the kind of how to make the internet more more human. Let's say, um, I think uh, that this idea of of you know this this idea of memory, um, really what Holoch Holochain like in the real world, let's say before the internet. You know, you you could have your own personal memory, and then you can have a kind of a, a community memory, a memory uh, sort of of people held in common. So this this sort of um, this sort of you know personal memory, and then kind of communal memory. And I think that's that's the kind of the analogy that that that's a, a kind of a good one for Holochain, which is ah. it, it really instead of having these kind of artificial. Towers of Babel, let's say it, it really goes back to a much more human kind of system, which is that everybody has their own individual memory, and then there's there's patterns of of of, uh, of communal memory within within particular contexts. Like let's say you have a village, and uh, you know people have stories of you know things you know funny stories, humorous stories, things that happened in the past. Uh, those things are passed down, and those things are remembered, and and you know passed from from uh, from individual to individual. Let's say. Um, and I think that's in terms of restructuring the internet to to something that's more more human. Um, that's that's the kind of the way I I kind of frame it. I really love that framing, and uh, it does make visible something else that I was wanting to point out, which is there isn't one holo chain, right? Holo chain is a pattern, uh, as as Tom had mentioned. We think of it as akin to DNA, DNA being a pattern. And different communities are going to use that pattern, but with some specific set of rules in order to coordinate their activities. And included in that activity is keeping track of some of the stuff that they've done together, right? The, the various actions that have happened. So they're holding memory in, as Philip said, in common. Um, but it's that, it's the members of that specific community holding their memories in common. And if I'm participating in that community and I'm also participating in another community, I'm contributing to the maintenance of both of those shared memory because those are the communities that I'm a part of. Uh, so, yeah. And then it sounded like we were, we're, we're getting close to wrapping up here. Um, in terms of ways to, uh, I'd love to ask Tom, are there ways of supporting ULEX I know you guys are are planning to be building some stuff on Holochain, uh, well as Tom and Philip. Are there ways of supporting uh, Ulex in moving forward? Oh well, thanks for asking. Uh, we'll have to to ask the same of you in Holochain and in the Holo market. Um, yeah, we have an Indiegogo fundraiser going right now. I think it's uh, coming close to an end, but it's doing really great. We are looking for 50k, and uh, I, I know we're getting close. I don't follow it day to day. Joe is in charge of that. The Startup Societies Foundation is basically helping with that. And Philip is coding some stuff. At least he and I are talking about that. Uh, on GitHub, there's a repository. And um, you know, there's not a ton to do there. But some people like to have that kind of community in their life. And I've been enjoying it. It's been my introduction to GitHub and reintroduction to coding stuff. I used to do it when I was a kid, really. Um, and uh, they can get a copy of my book, Your Next Government. That's the best, really. It's still the best source for info about Ulex, everything, all the coder's notes, discussion of the copyright issues, everything is in my book, uh, Chapter 3.7. And uh, and what can we do for you and yours, Matthew? Um, well, I'm looking forward to seeing Ulex start to become real in the world. Um, Holochain is, 
We've had four alpha releases. We've done our fundraising. Uh, we, we had a successful uh, initial community offering earlier this year. Uh, we're getting ready to release a beta release, so a slightly more stable um, version of Holochain. Though we're at, it's actually a complete rebuild because we're now we built in a different language in order to support uh, use in browsers and on mobile phones. And then Holo should be. We'll have our our initial release of Holo coming out hopefully by the end of this year. So uh, the main thing that I'm looking for is people to start playing with it and building um, and experimenting, especially with some of this stuff. I think it's early days still. Even basic things like simple reputation systems uh, where there haven't been many built yet. I mean, people are, it's, it's, yeah, it's early days where people are just going and building a chess app or, you know, a viral messaging app or things like that. There's, there's a handful of things, but, I'm, I expect over the next six or 12 months, we're going to see an explosion of interesting projects. And, uh, and I would love to see some of the cultural and civic and governance um, projects like the kinds of things you guys are interested in really be a part of that early, early push. So uh, just, just on that point, um, so I've uh, I developed a, a, a kind of an Ethereum smart contract just for the procedural rules of, of Ulex, but I'm really looking forward to the, the the release of uh, the stable version because I think uh, being able to uh, I think the approach we're 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 taking is that we we want to do versions on on multiple platforms. Um, per personally, I'm probably most excited about about Holochain. Um, so one of the great things, you know, if there's anybody listening to this, especially developers, um, if there are any developers out there uh, who are playing around with Holochain, you know, that they're interested in building something. Uh, it's an open source developer community, and uh, so we'd we'd be del delighted to have you involved. Um, so just get in contact with us. Uh, we have a Telegram group for for the Ulex open source community. You can just search it on Facebook as well. So um, yeah, that's that's it. Yeah, and I will give a shout out to the folks in the Holochain community. There are a lot of people in the Holochain community focused on governance. Um, I mean, there's a lot of appetite for this. So, folks, if you feel like this the, is something that you want to help make real in the world, reach out. <laughs> Go hit up Philip and Tom and, and start contributing to the repo. Well, excellent. Thank you guys for an engaging conversation here at the Startup Science Foundation. We love communities, uh, digital or physical, and the importance of having small decentralized experimental communities that can improve the world of governance. So thank you everyone and anyone listening on this call. Do everything in your power to help out the Holochain community, Ulex community, or finding a way to run uh, Ulex on Holochain. Thank you very much, and see you next time at the Startup Society's Foundation podcast.